I'm Ankit from YC. I'm here at NeurIPS with our YC and ArcPrize after party. I'm here with Karin Gull, the CEO of Cartesia, and we're really excited to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about what Cartesia is? Yeah, so um, Cartesia is a two-year-old company. We are um, formerly um, researchers from Stanford, uh, where we did our PhDs, um, and uh, we worked on architecture research there. Uh, decided that it was a very important research direction and we wanted to commercialize and build products around it. So we decided to start Cartesia. And a lot of people know us as a YCI company uh, in that we build uh, models for developers that are trying to build YCI applications. Um, I can describe it in a few different ways, uh, but um, I think that's like the common way that we're known. Rewinding a little bit, when you said that you're architecture researchers, can you tell us a little bit about what that means? You know, in a sense that a lot of machine learning for the last decade has been architecture research. Um, in, in more recent years, you see people working on scaling and more like engineering problems on a single architecture. What do you mean by when you say architecture research? Yeah, I think um, machine learning and AI is just um, putting data into architectures to make um, really cool models uh, on lots of compute, right? Um, that's a very uh, short way to put a very complicated endeavor, but uh, but I think um, it's clear in the last like um, ten years, like obviously with transformers and self attention and so on, like we kind of figured out like really good uh, recipes for building really powerful models, um, and that became then the entire industry around LLMs. I think that when we were grad students, we were um, this was back in 2019, 2020, uh, we were pretty interested in um, what are some of the biggest challenges that will remain when these models are scaled to their logical conclusion. And part of what we were pretty inspired by is human intelligence, right? Like humans are very uh, efficient, you know, intelligence for what? And um, are able to do, you know, multimodal uh, things, right? Like interact with people, right. um, take lots of actions, think, um, and be uh, very productive. Even the average human, quote unquote, average is, is very, very productive and, and is a feat of intelligence, basically, right? And so I think we were very interested in what kind of architectures would make that type of intelligence possible. Uh, that's very long context, that's very multimodal, where you can interact. And so I, I, we felt like the, the transformer paradigm, because of you know, limitations in, in the actual architecture itself, uh, would not be the right one to build something that's closer to human intelligence. And so we started working on it back in grad school. And um, when my co-founder, Albert, is a pioneer in the field, he uh, invented this area of space-based models, um, which are these um, recurrent models to, do, um, uh, to build you know, deep learning uh, models with. And, uh, and that's been um, you know, an interesting sort of uh, set of uh, research directions that we kind of undertook. And I think it was really a belief in the research and the fact that like, I think in AI, there's often a feeling of like, is there more to do? Uh, but I think we were always very optimistic about like, well, AI is a very big field and there's lots of unsolved problems. Like we should go out and do new things, not necessarily the same thing in a different setting, right? Which is often what I think has happened in the last few years. And so when you think about state-based models or architectures like that, you know, I, I think about the history of how models like the Transformer came about. You know, if I rewind the clock to 10 years ago, people were working primarily on RNNs to do language modeling and using LSTMs with attention, and that's eventually what led to the Transformer. Um, how should someone think about models like state-based models with that history in mind? Like, is there an analogy to what an RNN does versus what a Transformer does that this sort of answers uh, a limitation of each of these two methods? Yeah, I think, I think there's like, uh, architecture research is fascinating. Firstly, I think it's like super interesting for folks that are, um, you know, working on machine learning. I think more people should work on this stuff. There's different ways to think about intelligence, and like one uh, thing that we think a lot about is the this idea of compression mm. as being very sort of a very fundamental uh, primitive for intelligence, right? So if you have, uh, if you imagine trying to build a model that is going to reason over huge amounts of information. You know, obviously you need to abstract and reason over that information in some uh, more compressed form. Whether it's because you need to consolidate, you know, your understanding of the world, like what does a cup mean in text? What does a cup mean in the world physically? What does a cup mean when you, uh, you know, say the word out loud? Um, you know, all these different representation, audio, video, text, et cetera, need to be consolidated and put together in some way that's reasonable. And that um, also is, uh, something that can be used interactively, right? So basically what I mean by that is humans are able to take all of these representations and then use them to act in the world over a hundred years, right? 
So I think that transformers are fundamentally limited by their um, inability to model and compress like, compress representations in this way. And they're um, sort of like context window machines, right? Like uh, they're very retrieval oriented machines, right? Like I kind of think about the difference between like a raw text file and a zip zipped version of it, right? Like it's sort of like you want to have um, these like more abstract representation. The compression is a good, it's pressure to build those. And when you say that a transformer is a retrieval machine, are you saying that, you know, the specific primitive in a transformer with, you know, keys and values and queries is acting to enforce this prior as a, as something that would be effective at retrieval versus what other alternative architectures would do? Yeah, exactly, right? Transformers sort of sit at one extreme. That extreme is I have all of, like my historical data or my you know prompt or context, however you want to uh, frame it, is all available to me in raw form, and I can reason over it, and I can answer you know very specific questions about it um, as needed. And an example of that is I can recall facts exactly. SSMs have a fuzzier representation of the world, so they try to compress all this information, which means you lose fidelity, uh, but you at the same time gain something, which is by compression you build. Abstraction. So I think that's the tension. They live on different extremes. And in fact, one of the interesting things that's emerged is these hybrid models that are basically bringing together a lot of the strengths of both of these architectures. And you're seeing a lot of uh, modern models, like, you know, even like Quen, et cetera, like these, these sort of like open source models that are being built on different forms of hybrids, right? Like um, these are just classes of architectures. There's many variants and so on. There's subtleties in terms of how they're implemented, inferenced, et cetera. But I think uh, that's, to me, the conceptual difference in terms of the extremes that they occupy. And the question really is, like, what is the ultimate architecture, right? The, the, not, not the one that's, like, taking bits and pieces and putting it together, but ultimately what is going to be best for multimodal data where you can really learn and, and then use these models um, over like very long time scales. I think that's what we're interested in at least. And it's interesting you frame it in terms of multimodality because to your point earlier, many people consider you to be a voice AI company. And so in outsider's view might be, okay, this is a single modality. It's audio presumably or text maybe with some kind of text-to-speech thing yeah. going on. Uh, how do you think about what multimodality means in terms of the specific company you're making and why is that maybe an uh, at least an incomplete picture of how to think about it. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people, uh, when the word multimodal is said, they conjure up an image or a video in their heads, <laughs> I think. Um, I think uh, video models are very sexy, and role models are all the rage all the time. Uh, but I think what we're very interested in is what are the right approaches to actually build and scale multimodal models. And multimodal just means, like to me, a signal and uh, some sort of like discrete symbol or like text, right? That's kind of how we think about it. And so even a transcription model, which is uh, something that's perhaps considered one of the most boring tasks, is actually multimodal because you're actually trying to solve a very interesting problem of taking a signal and mapping it to a discrete set of symbols. Right, as opposed to it being a single, exactly. like, you know, in, a, in a standard LLM pre-trained right. set where it's from text to text. You're exactly. Saying, here you're going from audio signal directly. To right, text. and so when you have two modalities, you get many different types of tasks and, and you know different types of representations you need to build, right? So for example, uh, one is the prediction problem of like, can I generate a modality condition on the other one or maybe a combination of the two? There are problems in learning alignments between them, like uh, what part of audio corresponds to what text. That could be transcription, it could be trying to understand the audio in some way, like a person is yelling in this fragment of the audio or this piece of music is, uh, you know, reminds me of Mozart, right? Like right. these are all different ways of thinking about correspondences between them. So it's a very rich space. And the question is like, how do you do better unsupervised learning on multimodal data? Now, for us as a company, the part of the reason we really chose to work on this is, um, A, I think we wanted to find a, a grounded set of problems where you don't have to bite off the entire pie. Like, this is a very big space, and there are many difficult problems here. Uh, by so focus, as in, like, this is why you picked audio. You're yes, right. okay. this is why we picked audio and, and uh, audio text specifically, because it's a signal meets text problem. And there are many other signal meets text problems, like video and text and so on. But if you, I, we believe that if you can solve one in the right way, you can solve all of them. So that's one of the core beliefs we have around uh, how we do our research. That if you have the right recipe for building great audio text models, you will have the right recipe for building great um, models for robotics, for video, et cetera. Could you elaborate on that a little bit yeah. more? I mean, when you say it as a recipe, it makes sense. But when I think about, let's say, a robotics model, it's not intuitive to me what the recipe is you're referring to that comes out of 
audio that'd be directly relevant there. So help me understand. Like, yeah. what would that, I mean, maybe some of this is future you know, thinking, yeah. but just at least hypothetically, like what exactly do you mean by recipe? Yeah, a lot of the multimodal um, domains have common problems, which is, um, and I think here's, here's a crisp common problem, which is uh, you have a signal. How do you represent that signal in tokens in order to train models over it? This is a very, very standard problem. And so um, in audio, for example, you would want to take the audio signal and the audio wave file and turn it into a bunch of audio tokens and then train models on those audio tokens. In video, you do the same thing, images, same thing. In robotics as well, you construct, um, or in you know, these joint, you know, joint angles or you know, kinematic trajectories, you're constructing some sort of representation, discrete representation, and then you're trying to train models on it, especially if you're trying to predict these things. So um, it's very much the same set of problems. And so the core question is, how do you actually build the best representation of a signal? Right, that's the core question. And it, it goes to the heart of both architectures, but also this idea of tokens and tokenization. This is, this is the intersection that we work on. So we are trying to solve it from the lens of, you need new architectures, and you also need to rethink tokenization completely. Like you need to basically think about um, not audio as uh, you know, somebody's hand engineering uh, you know, 16 kilohertz signals into 50 hertz, but more as like, how do you learn over these raw signals in terms of hierarchies of abstraction inside the model directly, end-to-end -end learning of that. So a, a simple way to say it is we want to get rid of tokens right. and have the model learn this representation internally. And, and that part feels transferable. And that part is entirely transferable to any other signal in the world. Especially if it's done the right way, it would be like saying transformers work on different types of tokens, right? Like there's not, these are just like things that will work out of the box then. So that's why we wanted to have a focus point of view on one modality. The other piece was we felt like uh, the impact of all of this research on architectures ultimately as a startup needs to be on some real problems and products, right? So I think we were very interested in, as I said, quote unquote, building the average human or building these for these problems that are basically high interaction, um, uh, large context and lots of action taking. Um, so that's why we were like, okay, let's take the call center agent and think about that. Because that is actually a fairly complicated thing to build a AI call center agent right. with a model, right? Because you have to onboard that person on day one, and then you want them to do this job for the next 10 years, let's say, and improve and, and be able to interact with different you know, customers and, and, and you know, uh, help them with their, their queries and so on. So I think that's kind of one way we think about the company is we're first trying to solve it for this specific type of person. And then if we can do it the right way, we can then take that and use it to do a lot of things that quote unquote average humans do, which is not average at all, right. you know, uh, to be very clear, Definitely. right? Like it is actually extraordinary what people are able to do. But I think that's kind of where we think intelligence can head. And this is very different, I think, than the notion of like high IQ intelligence, which is very focused on math and physics. I don't have a, you know, a gold medal in any Olympiad. You only have a PhD from Stanford. I only have a PhD, and that's you know uh, a much lower fee, I would say, than getting a gold medal in one of these things. Albert, actually, my co-founder, has an Iowa gold medal, okay. so I, I won't speak for him. But the rest of us, you know, I think we we try to do our best and do some you know fairly productive work, I think. But it, it's not because we can solve math problems every day, right? It's because we're good at dealing with people, systems, uh, taking lots of context and using it to solve real problems. And I think that's what AI is not. And I, I think that it's because of the architectures and the way that we train these models and the way they're built and multimodality being one of the key things that is not working yet and not for any other reason. That's, that's our bet, basically. Interesting. And maybe as like a, a final piece yeah. to talk about here, you know, as you've been a researcher uh, in entering the space, you're a researcher at a university, now you run a research-driven company. You, you started to allude to it around, you know, why you have a product focus as a way of you know, making this become real. But I'm really curious as you, you know, think about you know, folks who might want to start research-focused companies or just in contrasting your time in research versus running a research-based company, what are some lessons you've learned about the kind of differences between these and how uh, your kind of product and research sides can coexist? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been, um, it's been very different from doing a PhD, for sure, and doing research. I think um, part of it is here, like, uh, in research, often when you're even in a PhD lab, like I was in Chris Ray's lab at Stanford, it's an amazing place, you know, during the time that I was there, we did flash attention, SSMs were happening, there's just Im amazing work happening. But I think part of it is that in grad school and in, in academic labs, you have 
uh, many different people with many different visions for what they think they should accomplish with research. And that's why it works, right? Because actually, like, there's a lot of curiosity about doing new things, and those things are all different, right? Um, I think in a company, it's almost the opposite, where there's only really room for one vision. Right. There's not really Explore room. versus exploit. Yeah, and I think within that, you have to find the room for exploration, right? And you have to sort of build a culture where people uh, feel like they're not being forced to do things that are... Uh, you know, the same old, same old, right? Like, it's not just like you do this work and that's all you do. But at the same time, there's not room for random exploration either. So I think that's the tension that is different about a research team that's in uh, a startup versus a research lab in academia. And I think it's right, actually, that that is the difference because I think that uh, at least we think you should be extremely focused on only one point of view and we should uh, prosecute that uh, to the end of the earth, right? And we happen to have very high conviction in that point of view uh, and happen to have worked on it for six years, but, uh, and one one will work for, on it for another 20 years if we can. But I think, uh, to me, product is something that drives discipline and truth to the work you do. Because, um, let's take an example, like I think we would never ship a product or a model uh, with an SSM in it just because. Right. Because we have customers and the customers that we have expect the best version of the product. Right. They don't care about the architecture. They don't care about the architecture. And that actually drives a lot of honesty into research because it means that like you are going to run experiments to prove that your product or your approach is better for the end user, not just because you want to publish something or you want to put something out there that's new or interesting. I think that's a level of intellectual honesty that product brings that I don't think is often seen in research, for better or for worse. I don't yeah, think it's right. because of... I don't think it's because researchers don't have the, uh, aren't honest about their work. I think it's just that everybody wants to do things that are new, right? At the end of the day. And I think you want to be able to have the right incentive to say, actually, you don't need something new when it's not necessary. And that's very important, actually. So, so we don't want to be, we want to be delusional about uh, how uh, we can change the world, but we don't want to be delusional about how well our, our models actually do or, uh, you know, how much impact our architecture will actually have. So I think that, that is not a place where I think delusion is good. I think precision is good there. So I think that's kind of how we think about it. Um, and that's why I think product is very important. For many other reasons, I have other uh, reasons. I think actually a lot of people undervalue the lessons that you know even YC teaches to founders. I think a lot of people think that research companies aren't governed by the laws of startup gravity. I happen to not believe in that. I think that all companies should be governed by the laws of startup gravity. So I think that the wisdom, the YC wisdom should actually be used by all research founders. And I try to try to do that as much as possible uh, and break the rules where necessary. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. Well, thanks so much for joining us. It was a yeah, lot of fun. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.